Batman Forever. My god, this film is terrible, really, and is massively deserving of a Mr. Hate reviews. I hate Batman Forever. Let me tell you why. Let's start at the start, shall we? Let's take a second to look at these intro credits, because that's the length of time the designers took making them. Would be okay if it was for Batman the Animated Series, but it's not. It's for a film with a theatrical release with $100 million as a budget. Windows Movie Maker has more streamlined animation than this, and this intro sets the tone for the entire movie. Cheap, but they spent serious money on it. It's perhaps really important to note that Warner Bros wanted to move away from the Tim Burton aesthetic because they thought it was too dark, too gritty, too adult. Sure, when you see Michael Keaton's Batman burning henchmen alive with the Batmobile, I can see why they might have wanted to move away. But those movies were successful, they made money, and they had their audience. What we shifted into was something painfully absent of any vision. It might as well have had a lobotomy. This is one of those films that manages the impossible. It's almost like the Twilight Zone of movies. Batman Forever, on a budget of $100 million, which, back in the 90s, was a substantial budget simultaneously looks like it costs a lot of money, and in the same stroke, looks like the cheapest low-budget garbage out there. It's the Schrodinger's cat of film budgets. Did it cost a lot? Did it not? I know, I know, you're probably thinking, that doesn't make any sense. Well, let me show you. Fantastic sets, locations, some great stunts, and reasonable fight choreography. And then we have this. And this. And this. And this is the entire film. What the Christ is this angle? Why is this angle in every shot possible? It's as if Joel Schumacher had a hard-on for angular shots. This movie has awesome sets, great locations, and it's just crapped all over with these weird angular shots. There are fan films better than this. Does Joel Schumacher have scoliosis or something? Is his neck permanently crooked? Outside of that, sure, we have a pretty balanced plot and story. It's Batman. It's what you'd expect, really. And we even get the introduction to the awesome Robin. You know, Batman's boy sidekick. But he's not a boy. Dick Grayson is a fully grown man. Okay, I get it. Maybe Joel Schumacher wanted to subvert some expectations and have an adult Robin. But no, because he's spoken to, treated like, and even adopted by Bruce Wayne as if he was a child. Bruce, it's good of you to take him in. Okay, I'm out of here. Excuse me? Look, I figured telling that cop I'd stay here for a while saved me a truckload of social service interviews and charity, so uh, no offense, but no thanks. See ya. Take it easy, Al. Bruce Wayne, what are you doing, mate? You're adopting a fully grown man. I know, Batman and Robin, the famous Batman and Robin, but it just doesn't seem right when you have a fully grown man being referred to as Master Dick. Master Dick? Up here, Al. Just checking, young sir. Something about that just adds a new dimension to their relationship. There's that, and that's bad enough, but then there's the fact this man, this grown man, acts like a child with scenes like this. No subversion of expectations, just Robin, the boy wonder that is a man. The way Dick Grayson discovers Bruce Wayne is the Batman as well. Jesus Christ, you've got to take into consideration that this is a working universe, right? Then why in the hell, when an intruder steps into the Batcave, as very clearly identified by the fact an alarm goes off, does the Batmobile and Batsuits and computer all stand to attention and reveal themselves? Talk about a massive design flaw. I can just imagine a plumber coming around to the Wayne Manor and accidentally stumbling on Batman's secret identity. This is the world's greatest detective, and yet you only need to stumble your way into the Batcave to learn his identity, because everything reveals itself. 
Right. Yeah. Or all right. Okay. But hey, this is Master Dick. Master Dick. The guy who has mastered the art of kung fu laundry. And whilst we're on the subject of character introductions, let's discuss Two-Face. Tommy Lee Jones as Two-Face. But for some reason, is doing his best Jack Nicholson Joker impression? Now, it's really not all that bad. It's a good hammy performance from Mr. Jones. But seriously, did no one on the set tell him that this was nearly identical to the Joker's mannerisms? It also introduces one of the biggest questions of the entire movie. Two-Face his creation, in court, and a man throws acid on him. Batman just leaps out from the stands? Was he just sat there in the bat suit? What, what, was he, what was he doing? Is he on the jury? Is he a witness? He didn't leap in from camera left or camera right. He quite literally just jumps from the viewing seats. What was he doing there? Just casually out for the day and decided to stop in to watch the district attorney put some criminals away? This is one of those scenes that absolutely baffles me. When you think about this being a working world and universe, it all falls apart. We have Jim Carrey as the Riddler, performing exactly the same character he used to in every single one of his 90s movies. A blend of the mask and Ace Ventura. When he is introduced as Edward Nigma, he actually puts in a pretty solid performance. However, when he suits up as the green, spandex-wearing, pink-haired version of Billy Idol, it all just gets a little too much. I understand every movie needs a suspension of disbelief, it's make-believe, but that suspension of disbelief is absolutely shattered when I'm sat there wondering how long it takes for Edward Nigma to apply his blusher before leaving the house as the Riddler thanks to epic continuity errors such as this. Why is this kind of mistake slipping through the dailies on a movie that had $100 million spent on it. $100 million. Whilst we're discussing continuity errors, let's take a look at one of the most offensive examples of where the director just didn't give a shit. Look at this! Look at this! Big diamond, small diamond. $100 million, ladies and gentlemen. $100 million. Blatant, bad, shoddy continuity. On the topic of makeup, let's discuss his hair. How is he doing this? Is he dyeing his hair? Is this a wig? Again, all I'm left thinking whilst Jim Carrey's Billy Idol light is on the screen is, did he and Two-Face help each other get ready? Were they sat around like two girls before a night out? This is also a movie that has a ravenous sexual predator in the form of Nicole Kidman. Yes, that's right. I'm sure when you have watched this, you, like me, didn't register just how horned up this chick was in the movie. Batman sees the bat signal, rushes to the top of Gotham PD, and outstrolls the Doctor. This dialogue is so painful. Black rubber. All right, so I get it. She finds Val Kilmer hot. But his response and the fact he walks away clearly shows he's not interested. And then what happens? She jumps in front of him, grabs his face, and begins manhandling him again. If Commissioner Gordon hadn't shown up, giving Batman his escape opportunity, the rate this woman was going, she likely would have sexually assaulted him. I'm sure by now you're thinking, why haven't I mentioned Batman? Val Kilmer's epic performance as the caped crusader. Well, I was saving it until last. From his very first scene, I hate it. What is his bat rope attached to? What is he swooping in from? He is swinging in between two buildings. Is his rope hanging from my suspension of disbelief? Because let me tell you, if it is, he's going to be falling a long way. As a Batman, Val Kilmer isn't all that bad. He puts on a reasonable performance, but it's thanks to shoddy continuity that it all just falls apart. I'm going to end on this note. This huge, stereotypical note. It's a horrendous movie with awful continuity, 
shocking angles, massive plot holes, and just general world-breaking instances that shatter my suspension of disbelief bigger than Batman's bat nipples. If you haven't watched it, it's definitely worth a watch, because it's hilariously bad and it's fun to hate. If, however, you think that there is anything remotely good about Batman Forever, please do let me know your thoughts down below in the comment section. If you're new here, hit that subscribe button, give this video a like and a share. If you want to see more Mr. Hate reviews in the future, they are a once a weekly endeavor, because these videos take quite a long time to make. As always, I've been Mr. H, and I will catch you in the next video.